Hi, BioFolks. We're going to finish up our discussion of photosynthesis by talking about three different classes of plants. So C3, C4, and CAM plants. As we go through each of the three types of plants, we're going to take a look at the cells and processes that are involved in each one. So a common term that you hear a lot when you're talking about photosynthesis is this idea of carbon fixation. And all that really means is that you take carbon from the atmosphere and you transform it into part of an organic molecule. So in our case, we're transforming carbon dioxide into glucose. And this is basically what the process of photosynthesis does. So here's our equation right down here. So essentially, we're taking the carbons from carbon dioxide, we're combining it with a couple of other things, and we're generating sugar. So this is our friendly light independent reaction diagram that we've been looking at for the last couple of days. And so we're going to just quickly look at carbon fixation in here. So we're taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and we're using that carbon to add to the carbons of RUBP, and then eventually we're making this three-carbon product down here called PGA. And this is why we call these reactions the C3 reactions. And then eventually, we're going to wind up making a molecule of glucose. So we've successfully taken carbon dioxide carbon out of the air and then made it into glucose, which has six carbons. Now, this reaction works really, really well, provided that you have a constant supply of carbon dioxide that's coming out of the atmosphere right up here. So let's imagine that this is the cross-section of a leaf, and right now we have a greater concentration of carbon dioxide and oxygen on the outside of the leaf than we do on the inside of the leaf. Right now we have a whole bunch of stomata that are open, and so eventually the carbon dioxide and the oxygen are going to diffuse from the outside of the leaf to the inside of the leaf, kind of like this. So provided the stomata stay open, eventually we'll reach a state of dynamic equilibrium where we have an equal concentration on both sides of the leaf. Now unfortunately, one of the problems with having your stomata open is that they can actually cause water loss via evaporation. For most C3 plants, they live in areas where it's not that hot, so this isn't a huge issue most of the time. But if you get a really hot day, this could be a problem. Or if you put a C3 plant in an area where it's much hotter and drier than normal. So to prevent water loss, the plant might close the guard cells of its stomates. Okay, so now all of my stomata are closed, and so I'm not losing any more water via evaporation. However, now I have a limited supply of carbon dioxide available, and so if I continue to do photosynthesis, eventually I'm going to lose all of my carbon dioxides. So this puts us in a real quandary here, because the plant can't open its stomates, because it's not going to be able to survive if it continues to lose water via evaporation, but it will also go into an extremely inefficient process called photorespiration if it allows oxygen to bond with rubisco. Remember that Rubisco allows carbon dioxide to bond with RUBP. However, uh, RUBP is actually not particularly picky, and if there is oxygen around, RUBP will bond with that instead of with carbon dioxide, which can actually bring the process to a halt. Take a minute to look back through this diagram and see if you can figure out what would happen to the Calvin cycle if you suddenly didn't have any more carbon dioxide. So hopefully you figured out by now that if you stop adding in carbon dioxide, you don't have enough carbons to run the rest of the Calvin cycle. So this particular situation would be extremely difficult for C3 plants, but there are actually a couple of classes of other plants that do really well in this particular situation. So let's take a look at that. We're going to take a look at this plant next, the C4 pathway. This picture by now should look really familiar to you. This is a standard C3 plant, so sort of like what we would see here in New England where it's pretty cold most of the time. This is the key for all of these structures here, starting with the waxy cuticle and working all the way down through the center of the leaf cross section, all the way down to the other waxy cuticle on the bottom. But now let's take a look at what happens when you have a C4 plant and how that looks similar and different. So this is a C4 plant. So before I zoom outwards, take a look at this and see if you can identify a few similarities and differences between this and the C3 plant. The two biggest differences that I want you to be familiar with are that the C4 plants, these grasses that grow in really hot, dry areas, tend to have a lot more 
palisade mesophyll cells, and they're also much more tightly packed together than in a C3 plant. And they also have much bigger bundle sheath cells, which is going to be these purple cells that are surrounding the vascular bundle right in the center here. So look at how much bigger they are in this C4 plant rather than in the C3 plant. And that's going to be important. Notice also that the bundle sheath cells and the palisade mesophyll cells are packed very closely together. Now we've been very familiar with the palisade mesophyll, and we've also been looking at the chloroplasts in a lot of detail, but bundle sheath cells are going to become very important in a C4 plant. In the C3 plant that we're familiar with, carbon dioxide combines with RUBP. Then it forms a three-carbon intermediate called PGA, which is why this is called the C3 pathway. Ultimately, it forms a six-carbon molecule called glucose, and then that gets carried around the plant by the phloem. Notice that this all takes place in the palisade mesophyll cells. Now let's go over to the C4 plant in the middle here. Now notice that there are two different kinds of cells that we're working with. So we have our palisade mesophyll cells up here, but down here we have something called the bundle sheath cells, and those are going to be extremely important. C4 plants start out being pretty different from C3 reactions because they actually use a different kind of compound to start with. So they use this thing called PEP instead of RUBP. PEP is much more selective than RUBP and will only combine with whatever carbon dioxide is left in the palisade mesophyll cells. So it will completely ignore oxygen, unlike RUBP. PEP has three carbons. Then it combines with a molecule of carbon dioxide, which has one carbon. The two of them together rearrange to form a molecule called oxaloacetate, which has a total of four carbons. This is why this pathway is called a C4 pathway. Its first compound here has four carbons. So we've now fixed carbon dioxide once. We've pulled it out of the atmosphere, combined it with PEP, and made this oxaloacetate molecule. Oxaloacetate is then converted into a new four carbon molecule called malate, and malate is actually going to exit this palisade mesophyll cell and diffuse into the bundle sheath cells. Once it's inside the bundle sheath cells, malate will split into two new molecules, pyruvate, which has three carbons, and carbon dioxide, which has one carbon. Waiting right there to pick up that carbon dioxide molecule is our old friend RUBP, which has five carbons. The Calvin cycle can then proceed normally and produce glucose. So before we move on, we should think about what happens to this molecule of pyruvate up here. So look back at your diagram and see if you can figure out what other molecule also has three carbons that might enable us to recycle this pyruvate. If you guessed that we might convert pyruvate back into PEP, you would be completely right. This process of reconverting pyruvate back into PEP does require a little bit of ATP, though. The pyruvate diffuses back into the palisade mesophyll cell and then becomes PEP again. So overall, it's important for us to remember that we wind up fixing carbon or converting it two different times. First, right up here when we took the CO2 out of the atmosphere and added it to PEP, and then a second time down here when we took this carbon dioxide molecule from the malate and added it to RUBP right here. Now we have to ask ourselves, why on earth would we bother going through all of these steps to create carbon dioxide down here if we already have a little bit of carbon dioxide up here? And that's actually a really valid question, but the important thing to remember is that this palisade mesophyll cell that's up top right here is actually full of two different kinds of gases. So you have the CO2, which you really want, but you also have the oxygen, which you really don't want. And the good news is that with this pathway, you're keeping this RUBP molecule, which will pick up either oxygen or carbon dioxide. You're keeping it away from all of the oxygen, which is up here in this cell right here. So even if you have only a tiny bit of carbon dioxide, you can use this C4 pathway. And even though this pathway exists in C4 plants, they can also do the C3 normal photosynthesis process that we've been talking about. The way that I like to think about the C4 pathway is as a selective carbon pump. So it can engage this pathway if conditions require it. So it's not going to do this all the time. It's actually a little bit more efficient to do this pathway right here, the C3 pathway. But C4 plants are pretty flexible. They can do C3 if conditions are great, and then they can go into C4 mode if things are not so great.
Now let's talk about CAM plants. So CAM stands for Crassulation Acid Metabolism, but we're just going to call them CAM plants. CAM plants tend to live in areas where it's very hot and dry, and so they tend to keep their stomates closed during the daytime and then only open them up at night. Now this is great because it helps to prevent water loss because at night it's a lot cooler, but it also really limits when they can do photosynthesis because of course at nighttime when they're bringing in carbon dioxide through the open stomata, you also don't have any sunlight out and so you can't do regular photosynthesis. So they solve this problem by doing photosynthesis in two different stages. So I'm going to divide this palisade mesophyll up into two stages right here. So the top one is going to be what happens at night and then the bottom part is going to be what happens during the daytime. CAM plants are going to behave a lot like C4 plants at night. They're going to bring in carbon through their open stomata in the form of carbon dioxide, and they're going to fix it into this creature right here called malate that we saw in our last bit. Malate is then stored until the light comes back again during the day. From there on out, these plants behave a lot like C4 plants. The malate splits into pyruvate and carbon dioxide, and we can use the carbon dioxide to run the Calvin cycle now that the light is back again. We produce glucose just like we did earlier, and we send the pyruvate back to be converted into PEP. Notice that in CAM plants, everything is taking place within the mesophyll cells, and we're not using any bundle sheath cells. CAM plants don't have too much oxygen, so we don't need to worry about keeping the oxygen away from the RUBP. All we have to worry about is preventing water loss. This pathway allows the CAM plant to take advantage of having the stomata open at nighttime to bring in carbon dioxide and then having them close during the day to prevent water loss while still being able to do the photosynthesis process and make glucose. So there you have it. That's C3, C4, and CAM plants all on one screen. So if you're confused about any of these processes, make sure you go back and rewatch or bring your questions to class.